I will turn the podium over to John Efron to present the topic of laparoscopic treatment of rectal cancer. Should it be or is it the standard of care? John, tell us, please. Okay, thank you, Steve. That's a great introduction. We're just uh, switching over here to the slides. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Wexner for the uh, privilege of speaking on this topic today. Um, and I'd also like to uh, give everyone who's listening a uh, warm invitation to attend SAGES this year in Baltimore. We're very happy and proud to have it in our city here. And if anyone is coming and would like to have a, 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 a tour of the facility or take a quick walk around, just let us know. We'd, we'd love to have you. So um, what we're uh, going to talk about today is the uh, minimally invasive management of rectal cancer. Unfortunately, I have no disclosures to present. Um, when talking about standards of care, what we're really talking about is quality and outcomes. And uh, when talking about quality and outcomes for cancer, we have both short-term and long-term um, uh, uh, factors that we evaluate. Short-term complications, whenever we're talking about a surgical procedure, of course, mortality and morbidity. Um, in this case, when we're looking at cancer, as particularly rectal cancer, the pathological uh, assessment is also uh, of key importance. So total mesorectal excision specimen, the circumferential margins, the intactness of the specimen when talking about colon and rectal cancer. Lymph node harvest is uh, of key importance as well. Long-term complications uh, associated with this are uh, sexual uh, function or dysfunction, bladder dysfunction wound complications and hernia rates, um, as well as uh, a bowel obstruction and overall bowel function. Uh, finally, the ultimate uh, in dealing with cancer uh, studies is looking at recurrence and survival. And so when looking at laparoscopic procedures for um, uh, rectal cancer, what we need to look at is these uh, quality measures to determine whether they are uh, equal or better uh, to what we currently do through an open technique. So there are two questions really we're asking is, can we do the same operation laparoscopically that we can do through a big incision? And the other question is, does the physiology of the laparoscopic procedure affect the uh, uh, tumor biology uh, that uh, exists with colon and rectal cancer? Well, the second question we've, we've answered, I think, quite uh, convincingly over the last 20 years. Um, as everyone knows, with laparoscopic colectomy, there was a, 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 a significant problem when we first started doing this in the early 1990s. As people like Dr. Wexner started pioneering this technique, there was uh, difficulty with early port site recurrences and um, also early uh, recurrences in general. And uh, this was particularly concerning because they were early T1, early stage tumors. And uh, they were unexplained. And so what this did was put the kibosh or the brakes on performing laparoscopic surgery, at least through the uh, societies um, that deal with a lot of colon and rectal uh, diseases, such as the Society of uh, Colon and Rectal Surgery, the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgery. So, they looked at the short-term and long-term uh, markers uh, of uh, laparoscopic uh, colon surgery, such as lymph node harvest, proximal and distal margins, radial margins, specimen length, and local and distant recurrence, port site recurrence, and survival. And we really found that with all of those markers, there was no difference. Well, these are some of the studies that looked at port site recurrences uh, early on in the 90s and found that really um, well, this is, excuse me, this is lymph node retrieval for laparoscopic versus open colorectal surgery. And really, we found that we would uh, retrieve the same lymph nodes, whether we were doing an open or laparoscopic procedure. Um, and for port site recurrences, there were many theories on what might cause these port site recurrences that all related to the actual technique of laparoscopic surgery. But we really found that wound recurrences um, in laparoscopic surgery, if you look at all the studies that were done in the 90s, is uh, uh, if you look at accumulated variance, about 0.64%. Well, compared to open surgery, it's, it's very similar. So really, there was nothing that we found of the, in the physiology that adversely affected um, uh, colon and rectal cancer patients. So we have equality between laparoscopic and open resections for lymph node harvest, proximal distal margins, radial margins, resection length, and uh, 
wound recurrences. But uh, do people have the same outcomes with this? And uh, these are the, probably the four um, best studies that documented that there was a significant, well, that there was uh, equality within uh, um, with both mor mor morbidity, mortality, and, and uh, um, recurrence rates between uh, laparoscopic and open procedures. So with that in mind, we'll now press forward to rectal cancer. The one thing I talk <clears throat> to all of our residents about rectal cancer is uh, the surgical procedure or the surgical uh, uh, operation, the operation we do for rectal cancer, has been well examined, probably more so than any other cancer operation with respect to technique um, and outcomes uh, in the past uh, 30 years. And uh, Professor Heald uh, from Bezenstoke, who I know is great friends with, uh, with Dr. Wexner, um, has really, uh, whilst not uh, inventing the anatomic dissection, uh, deserves full credit for uh, teaching and uh, making public awareness of this anatomic dissection that we do um, uh, uh, on, a, on a daily basis. And what we're really talking about here is uh, an, a, a total mesorectal excision where the dissection of the rectal fascia and the planes are done in such a way so as not to violate those planes. And in doing so, we have significantly reduced the recurrence rate and increase the survival rate uh, for rectal cancer patients. And I, there has really been no other um, surgical procedure, to my knowledge, that has documented so well that surgical technique makes such an important difference and influence into outcomes. This is a, a poor picture, but a picture nonetheless of the total mesorectal excision technique with uh, um, the bilateral or, or butt-like visualization of the posterior mesorectal uh, fascia. And what we're talking about is this radial margin as well. Um, an anterior margin where the entire uh, lymph node pedicle around the rectum is excised en masse. And if we look at uh, Professor Hale's data, when he published it in 1998, his five-year and 10-year data, he had uh, local recurrence rates of 6 and 8% um, for all patients. For curative patients, he had local recurrence rates of 3 and 4% in disease-free survivals of 80 and 78%. Um, truly amazing when you think that before that, local recurrence rates before this technique was instituted were up in the 30, 35 to 40% range at excellent institutions worldwide. Uh, if you look at uh, accumulation of all of the uh, patients that have been reported, at least up until 2006 or 7, uh, these are several series that have been reported meta-analysis looking at uh, local recurrence rates, and really we can see that an accepted local recurrence rates nowadays for rectal cancer is somewhere between 5 and 10 percent. So the question, I'm sorry? So the question is... No, I'm um, saying maybe, maybe we could just take a little hiatus here before we go on to the technical aspect in the talk. Sure. Just uh, to, to give some folks a chance to to weigh in, because there, there, before you go into the laparoscopic technique, which I, I know is coming up in the talk along with some of the results, um, just, just some fundamental questions which I can uh, address to you and we can perhaps ask some others after that. Uh, firstly, one thing you, you, you didn't mention, obviously in the interest of time, but, but staging. I mean, you're deciding to do a, a, a TME sure. as opposed to a TEM, for example. Um, has staging changed? Is, is it still ultrasound? Is it, is it MRI? Sure. Uh, what, what are you doing to make your decision for technique as well as for the use of neoadjuvant? Sure. So um, that's a great question. Still actually uh, surrounded in a bit of controversy, which is I think why you're asking it. Um, for staging for rectal cancer is important. Uh, we do stage everyone preoperatively because it makes a difference on how we approach these patients. Um, uh, currently, uh, in the United States, standard of care is a long course therapy with chemoradiation for patients who are T3, uh, who have T3 tumors or those who have uh, any evidence of lymph node disease. Now, we used to use uh, ultrasound to do this. Um, 
with fairly good accuracies uh, if you were an experienced sonographer at looking at uh, um, depth of invasion and, and moderate accuracies at looking at lymph nodes. We're talking about approximately 70 to 80 percent accuracy for depth of invasion and approximately 60 to 70 percent accuracy for lymph node uh, involvement. Uh, now, at this institution, we re rely uh, uh, entirely on MRI. We've set up an, uh, a rectal cancer MRI protocol here. Um, we find it uh, gives us um, more standardization to the technique, to the reporting, um, and uh, a little bit better uh, ability to look at the uh, lymph nodes in the uh, uh, internal iliac chains, involvement of other uh, structures. Um, and a better definition of uh, involvement of the pelvic floor musculature. So um, staging is important because it makes a difference as to how we proceed. I think there's a lot of uh, controversy now with transanal excisions, and I don't see that uh, controversy um, resolving any time in the near future. But um, we, uh, we, my personal bias is that I am uh, reluctant, even with early stage or early T tumors, especially in young people, to do transanal excisions. But when doing them, we, we do approach them through uh, either a, a, a TEM or TAMIS approach. Thanks, John. Let, let me um, just pick up on one thing you said, and perhaps we can go to Imperial College in, in London if Ara Darzi is there, and that is the use of neoadjuvant for T3 lesions. Um, we're, we're familiar with some of the work, uh, particularly from the UK, from Gina Brown about demonstrating threat and margins to try and give us some guidance as neoadjuvant. Can we go to Imperial uh, College in uh, London if our Darzi is there and, and ask uh, Professor Darzi that question uh, or Paris Tekas or anyone else who, who wants to tackle it. What, what is the current status in, in the UK um, for neoadjuvant therapy? Are, are, are all T3 lesions being treated? Is it um, selective um, use uh, for threat and margins. Perhaps uh, you could expand on that. Hi, Steve. Uh, hi, everyone, and nice to be with you. Uh, we, we don't have the best signal here, so I'm not entirely sure whether you can hear me or not, but it's been a struggle to listen to you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can we can hear you. you. And uh, it, 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 it's normally a struggle having to listen to me, Ara. I get that. That's with or without the <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was trying to be polite, Steve, so uh, uh, that's, that's the So uh, the, the answer to that question is it depends where you are. I mean, the, the one unique thing about Gina Brown is that Gina Brown herself is quite unique. And uh, she's developed this astonishing skill of sitting down in an MDT and looking, really looking at the threatened margins. And in all of these cases that have been discussed in uh, at least in the two organizations that I work with, with Paris Techis, uh, we all of these patients get neoadjuvant uh, radio chemotherapy. We are more selective if the margins are not uh, involved, and, uh, and so it, it's yes for those with threatened margins, uh, and, and, and not 100% for those who don't have a threatened margin. Which, which represents somewhat of a paradigm shift uh, for us here in, in, in the US. Um, Maybe uh, one other center just to weigh in uh, from, from the U.S., John Marks in, in Lankanaw. Um, if we can go to Lankanaw Medical Center and, and ask John, particularly in, in light of the use of a lot of the very distal resections, your, your TATA procedures, interesphincterics and the like, what are your criteria for new adjuvant these days? And how are you determining that? Sure. Um, I would say that uh, our criteria and our as stated, uh, threat and margins, which we would define as cancers in the distal third of the rectum. Clearly, if you're looking to uh, employ sphincter preservation. So if in our center, uh, neoadjuvant therapy is recommended for patients with uh, T3 cancers at any level, as well as uh, cancers in the distal half of the rectum, said uh, succinctly. Okay, so pretty, pretty much the traditional um, U.S. view on that. 
Um, John, if we uh, turn back to you a little bit on, on the technique and let you continue your talk, anybody with questions, you can uh, send them in as noted on the screen or, or dial into the uh, number in, uh, listed on the screen. Okay, great. Well, I, I think when we, when we start talking about laparoscopic proctectomies uh, with a TME technique, we have to define it, and that's actually not as easy as you would think because there are about at least three or four different ways of doing this. Um, one is uh, a traditional laparoscopic procedure um, utilizing uh, a full laparoscopic technique. One is a hand-assisted procedure, which ut utilizes uh, a hand to mobilize the colon and then oftentimes an open rectal dissection to remove uh, the, the tumor, doing a, really an open TME. Um, one now is the SILS approach, um, which uh, utilizes the SILS technology. Um, one is the robotic approach, um, and uh, as uh, Dr. Wexner mentioned, the Tata approach, which I think really would, would be seen as a, a traditional laparoscopic, purely laparoscopic approach with a transanal resection um, and uh, anastomosis. So, um, uh, and now also where it, people are instituting a combination of uh, TEM, where the uh, Pelvic dissection is performed through uh, either SILS, tech, not SILS, but the TAMIS technology or, or the TEM technology um, to perform the uh, distal, middle, and even proximal uh, mesorectal dissection and then a laparoscopic approach for the abdominal technique. So we have lots of different definitions, but I think uh, to date, most of the data we have is really um, either with a robotic technique, um, we have a little bit of data, but the, pre predominantly the, the majority of the data is a laparoscopic approach that uh, u utilizes traditional laparoscopic equipment um, and uh, uh, either a uh, double stapled anastomosis or a uh, transanal anastomosis for the rectal cancer. Port placement varies for when using the, the, the when doing the uh, rectal dissection for whatever pathology. I utilize a diamond technique, which uh, is shown here um, uh, for uh, the laparoscopic procedures. You know, you can uh, do the whole procedure and bring it out either through a fan and steel, an umbilical, periumbilical, or a transanal excision. And you can see here uh, a nice specimen of someone who had. Um, uh, FAP and uh, small rectal cancer with um, the uh, uh, shiny uh, mesorectal fascia uh, intact. And you can end up with uh, small incisions, no incisions, port site incisions, however you'd like to define it. So let's look a little bit at some of the data that's available to date. This was a study published in 2007. It was a prospective randomized trial comparing 39 open with uh, 34 lap TME. They found no difference in the tumor stage between the two groups, and the median lymph nodes retrieved were 19.2 for both the lap and the open. So we're, we're looking here at those same oncological outcome markers um, that we looked at for uh, colon cancer to clearly define that laparoscopic proctectomy is an, a viable solution, and here we have good evidence of that. Um, in 2006, there was a Cochrane review of the data uh, up until that point in time. Interestingly, there were 4,000 patients, a total of 48 studies, and only one of those studies was really what we would call um, an excellent uh, prospect of randomized trial. There were some cohort trials, some case control trials, um, uh, um, and um, uh, one trial with three and five year follow up. Um, they found no dis dif difference in the studies that did have three and five year survival with these uh, prospective trials between uh, um, uh, laparoscopic and open procedures. Um, the, the survival ranged from 63% to 92.1%. Local recurrence was excellent, 3.7 to 6.8%. Um, mortality, there was no difference. Morbidity, there was no difference. Quite a big range in morbidity in this study between 6 and 37% and uh, no difference in the anastomotic leak rate, also quite a big range between 0.5 and uh, 37 percent. The laparoscopic TMEs did show significant benefit with GI recovery, post-operative pain, analgesia use, length of stay, and blood loss. The immunological response was in one study, and uh, I don't think we can take that with 
much of a grain we have to take that with a bit of a grain and salt grain of salt at least uh, currently there isn't been a lot of other work to date to support that and the open TME had significant benefit uh, in the duration of surgery and one study showed a reduction in the cost so the first randomized trial on a multi-center level to really address this was published in the Lancet it was the classic trial that looked at both laparoscopic colon and rectal uh, procedures for cancer um, they had uh, 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 multiple patients involved uh, in the study, all close to, I think, seven or 800. Um, but for the uh, rectal cancers, there was uh, uh, close to 400 patients. It was an intent to treat analysis, um, and they looked at uh, 132 open and actually uh, had 160 laparoscopic cases. The conversion rate was quite high with these rectal cancer uh, procedures. 57%, uh, and I think that's an indication um, uh, uh, of the difficulty of these procedures. They're not easy procedures to do, and I think I, I usually take this point in time when talking about this to, to say you really need to be two things um, when doing uh, laparoscopic rectal cancer surgery. You need to be uh, a pelvic surgeon who is completely comfortable with the pelvic anatomy, whether you're doing it laparoscopically or open. Um, you need to have a good knowledge of rectal cancer, and you need to be an excellent laparoscopic surgeon. So um, it really takes all of those things to do this uh, procedure adequately. Complication rate was equal between the two groups, and there was no difference in the circumferential radial margins for either the anterior resections or the APRs between the open and the laparoscopic groups. And when they looked at their three-year outcomes, yes. Sorry, just to yes. stop you a second, we've got a question for you from the Medical College of Wisconsin. We can turn over to the Medical turn College of Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Uh, Good morning, Steve. Can you hear us okay? Hi. We yeah, can hear you. Can hear Kirk's around you. Good morning. John, thanks for laying out some of the different approaches to, to minimally invasive uh, proctectomy. And Steve, you were asking about staging. And I, we were sitting here and talking and thinking about um, what actually pushes people into when you have these different techniques in your repertoire into using one or the other of them as you uh, think about your patient. And for most of us, I would think that unless it's a, a T4 um, cancer, more likely to base our decision making about what approach we're going to use based on some other factors like patient habitus or um, bowel function, things like that. But we were interested to know what other people thought about it. And when we look at papers presented by experienced laparoscopic surgeons, there's often a, a bunch of people who have been excluded from the laparoscopic approach. We still don't really have a clear handle on why that is. Um, and I, again, is the mesorectal fascist threatened, but they've had radiation, will we do it laparoscopically or not? So just interested in people's thoughts about that. Thanks, Lauren. John, you want to tackle that first? Sure, sure. I think um, when looking at the different approaches, especially for this technique, I think one of the things you'll see is that um, well, there are m many different ways of approaching the middle and distal rectum, which is really the difficult laparoscopic portion of this procedure. And it's uh, the ability to get adequate retraction and visualization. And so I think whilst you're seeing lots of people coming up with different ways of approaching that area, I think it's because it is difficult. Um, things that make it more difficult is body habitus. Uh, obese patients, uh, it's much more difficult to, um, to uh, 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 get the adequate retraction you need, I think. Um, size of the tumor can, can, can play a role, uh, and uh, the size of the pelvis. So, I think the reason you see a lot of different techniques, at least in approaching the mesorectum, whether it's a Tata approach, uh, TAMIS slash TEM approach, um, versus a traditional laparoscopic versus a robotic approach, is that it is a difficult dissection with a relatively high conversion rate, and people are trying to come up with ways to make it a little easier. Um, I think if you look at, it's interesting, there's been a lot of data published uh, recently looking at large databases in this country, whether you're looking at the National Inpatient Safety Database or you're looking at the SEER Medicaid database, and you look at those studies that compare uh, open and laparoscopic procedures for complex colorectal conditions such as uh, uh, ileal pouches or, or rectal cancer, you'll see that um, 
they do find a clear-cut benefit with the laparoscopic approach. However, if you look at the selection bias that takes place in those studies, the, 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 the laparoscopic patients have a lower ASA score, a lower BMI. And so as surgeons, we are naturally, when we're not randomizing patients, selecting for a better patient population when approaching these, um, these patients. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. As, as we go on through the talk, I mean, there are um, you know, clear benefits to the laparoscopic procedure, but I mean, the color trial, color two trial that just came out showing short-term benefits show some clear-cut benefits, but overall, when we get to it, you'll see that the, the morbidity and the mortality weren't different between the two groups. So it's still a, a fairly morbid procedure, whether you're doing it open or laparoscopically. So let, let's just solicit uh, another opinion on that. If we, if we could go to IRCAT in Strasbourg, France, and if uh, Jacques Marasco or Joël Leroy, uh, one of the staff there, could, could take the question in Strasbourg uh, about um, what, what are the current contraindications, if any, to minimally invasive approach? Or what, what are the settings for rectal cancer in which you would, if any, in which you would perform a laparotomy instead of minimally invasive approach? Um, good morning, uh, Stephen, and thank you for your question. Uh, recently, there was a survey concerning the laparoscopic uh, colorectal procedures in France, and uh, it was surprising for me to see that uh, around 40% of the rectal uh, cancer were operated by laparoscopic approach. I don't know if it is a complete full laparoscopic approach, but 40% are um, uh, operate with a laparoscopic uh, technique. Um, and uh, I'm, more and more, we have uh, a minimally invasive surgery with a surgeon trained that are able to do and with uh, probably good results, this uh, uh, approach. Because the conversion rate is not so high. And um, um, this proves that after 20 years, of teaching, training, more and more people are doing. And uh, this is probably, uh, as you know, uh, the beginning uh, to prepare the next step that will be less and less minimal invasive, as uh, you evocate uh, before, concerning uh, limited resection by transanal uh, hybrid technique um, uh, with uh, selective cases. Thanks. And you have the contraindication. Contraindication. Yeah. I will say as a surgeon, because if you have no training, uh, uh, as you uh, said the uh, uh, lecturer before, uh, when we have to operate an obese patient with uh, uh, a male narrow pelvis, it would be very a big challenge. Open laparoscopy. And if you don't know the tricks for doing a procedure, if you operate uh, five cases per year, you will not do laparoscopic technique. And uh, only to remember in Korea, for example, I asked a question, uh, what is the advantage of robotic? Uh, perhaps it is for obese patients with BMI above 30. They said to me, it's a contraindication of laparoscopy and robotic. It's only open procedure for BMI above 30. So you imagine in states how many patients you will operate. <laughs> for Thank, us, it's mainly the that, that's, a, that's an excellent point and a, and a very provocative thought, too. I appreciate that, Joel. And, and thanks, Lauren, for stimulating that part of the discussion. Let's return to John and uh, hear some of the uh, additional results and controversy of, of minimally invasive approaches. Okay, so uh, we'll keep moving through. Uh, so this is the color trial which was just published um, uh, this month in uh, Lancet Oncology. This is the color two trial, which is um, the biggest trial, uh, multi-center trial, looking at uh, laparoscopic procedures for rectal cancer. Um, it's uh, a truly a, a great achievement, um, and the authors and every participants to be ap applauded. Um, there were 30 centers in Europe that randomized patients from 2004 to 2010. They uh, looked at rectal cancers that they defined basically as a tumor within 15 centimeters of the anal verge. No patients could have evidence of metastatic disease, and there was a two-to-one randomization, laparoscopic to open uh, um, uh, 
performed. The analysis was a modified intention to treat analysis, and uh, 11,000 patients were enrolled, and 1044 were eligible for analysis. And just to summarize the results quickly, they had uh, 699 patients in the laparoscopic group, 345 in the open group. Blood loss was significantly less in the laparoscopic group. Uh, length of surgery was significantly uh, longer in the laparoscopic group. Bowel function uh, started a day earlier in the laparoscopic group, and patients were discharged from the hospital a day earlier. Um, the uh, complete, uh, the gross assessment of the TME uh, specimen was uh, 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 equal between the two groups, as you can see here, 88, 92 percent, with no difference. Positive circumferential margin, which was defined as a margin closer than two millimeters, was equal between the two groups. Distal margins were equal between the two groups. And the morbidity was equal between the two groups. But again, I show you this morbidity in the laparoscopic group was 40 percent. That's a significant morbidity when we think that laparoscopic procedures, we think, help decrease some of the uh, morbidity that we worry about. Mortality was excellent between the two groups as well. I think I like to show uh, this study that was published in 2004, because I think it was really the first prospect of randomized trial that uh, had good five-year follow-up. Um, this was a study published in the Lancet of 403 patients, conversion rate of 23.2 percent. It was prospectively randomized. You can see 203 patients in the laparoscopic and open group. Um, really uh, no difference in complications. Incision, uh, I mean, um, operative time was a little bit longer in the laparoscopic group. Distal margins were the same. Lymph nodes were the same. Cost was a little greater. Um, but what's interesting here is that we see that the incisional hernia rate in the laparoscopic group was a little bit higher, and I think we're seeing that as well from some of the studies that look at right colon uh, resections um, as well. But their five-year survival was excellent in both groups with a, a 76 and 72 percent survival, and the disease-free survival was similar. So in the interest of time and to stimulate discussion, we'll just uh, go on a bit. This was a, a wonderful meta-analysis put out in 2006 by uh, uh, Professor Aziz um, with 27 studies, 2,000 subjects, um, and uh, we had the laparoscopic surgery group showed reduction in the length of stay, uh, time to stoma function, time to di diet and first bowel movements. Um, the lap APR groups had reduced analgesia required and reduced wound infection rates, which is a huge issue for us here in the United States now, um, and no difference in uh, any of the oncologic uh, outcomes that we look at. Uh, robotic proctectomy, we uh, started to hear a little bit about that and uh, the role of it. It's become very popular here in the United States, and more and more people are doing robotic both colectomy and proc proctectomy procedures. Um, I'll give you my own personal little bias on this. I think uh, the robot is a tool. It's a tool to be utilized just like any other minimally invasive instrument. Um, I think it is helpful for the obese patient. I think it has been shown in some case-controlled and retrospective studies to reduce the, comp the um, conversion rate when doing uh, rectal procedures, and I, I think it's a benefit in the pelvis, and I don't, don't see too much of a benefit in the other parts of the abdomen, but because of the narrow confines of the pelvis and the ability to generate torque with a robot, I do think it is helpful there. Uh, Alicio Pagazzi still has some of the best literature presented on the robot for rectal cancer when he was at City of Hope Hospital. Um, this is, uh, was published in Annals of Surgical Oncology, 39 patients um, with a conversion rate of 2.6 percent. Um, they were mid to low rectal cancers that were uh, T2 and T3. Median hospital to say was four, four days. All margins circumferentially and distally were negative and uh, the median lymph node uh, removed was uh, 13. His fall at that time was uh, 13 months, and he had no recurrences. And then if you look at the three-year follow-up of 64 patients, the conversion rate re went up a little bit to 9.4 percent, still significantly lower than some of the other studies we've been looking at. Leak rate was 7.7 percent, with a median lymph node harvest of 14.5, and a local recurrence of 3 percent, and an overall recurrence of 9 percent. So if you look at the robot-assisted procedures that are being done in the United States now, this just came out uh, this last year in surgical endoscopy, you can see that the majority of the time the robot is being used in the United States for uh, pelvic procedures, either anterior or 
resections or APRs, and I think that's really where uh, we see the, see the benefit. And you can see that uh, the conversion rate in this combined series for an anterior resection was 0.4 percent uh, with a low morbidity rate. So I think that may be the, the role we see for it. So where do we stand now? We stand basically that I think we have evidence to suggest we can do a similar oncologic operation if you are an expert in, in both pelvic surgery and laparoscopic surgery with similar open TME results. We have seen the benefits with the laparoscopic approach that we see with the uh, uh, other laparoscopic approaches uh, with respect to colon and rectal surgery. Um, I think the guidelines for laparoscopic colectomy um, for cancer should be uh, carried over to the rectum, and I do think you do have to do some case selections, T3 tum T4 tumors, bulky tumors, um, and uh, patients who are morbidly obese perhaps are not the best candidates for this approach. Um, where are we going? Well, we just had the results of the uh, Color 2 trial. Um, I think we are just about done uh, uh, um, accruing patients for the uh, ACASOG trial run by Jim Fleshman here in the United States, and hopefully we will have some short-term results on that study in the near future. We'll wait the long-term results from the Color 2 trial. And there was a Japanese trial comparing uh, lap and open colon and rectal cancer procedures that uh, we're still waiting for. So again, I'd like to thank the uh, inviting organization for the privilege of speaking today and uh, uh, wish to welcome all of you to Baltimore uh, in late April. Hopefully it won't be snowing. And uh, uh, thank you again. John, th thanks for a very nice and very provocative, comprehensive talk and a good historical overview. Um, but you're not, not off the hook just yet. Let, let's get a little more discussion. You, you touched on the, uh, the robot potential uses in, in the obese patient. I want to turn to the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, if I could, see if uh, Barry Salky, Dan Heron, who, who's there, that might be able to address the role of robotics for rectal cancer surgery at Sinai. Um, perhaps not. Um, anybody there wanting to tackle? Any of the staff there? Um, no, there are none of the staff. Um, I'm the fellow on the service. Uh, as far as I know, we do not use the robotic, um, the robot for uh, the in obese patients for um, lap, for uh, minimally invasive rectal surgery. Okay, it's not maybe used at we all can here uh, at this thank institution. Thank you. Tell, tell Barry. I hope he's having a good morning. Um, <laughs> if we can uh, turn turn. Uh, if we can turn to Ohio State University, uh, Scott Melvin or, or Chris Ellison, um, anybody at Ohio State could comment on uh, the use of uh, the robot. What's your preferred approach for, let's uh, say specifically, in a, a, uh, an obese male, not morbidly obese, but obese male with a distal third rectal cancer? You think you can do sphincter preservation, open laparoscopic, robotic, why? This is Alan Harsman. Uh, Scott's not here this morning. Hey, we would do that person laparoscopically. We've not done that many robots. Okay, that's uh, also excellent uh, and, and succinct answer. Uh, I've got a question here from main campus. Um, we could turn to Cleveland Clinic main campus in Ohio and uh, uh, field the question. Phil, hello. good morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, Lucas Luca, good morning. Luca. Hi, good morning. Um, I would like to thank Jonathan uh, Efron for the excellent presentation. I, uh, I wanted to ask uh, uh, some questions regarding laparoscopic surgery in general and robotic in particular um, and uh, uh, open it to debate for uh, whoever wants to make a comment on that. Uh, the first one is um, uh, there seem to be a subset of patients which, as uh, Dr. Leroy was uh, pointing out, is uh, significant in the United States, which uh, do not seem to be a good uh, group of patients to approach uh, with any minimally invasive technique because of their height, their weight, and their narrow pelvis, uh, often associated with male gender. Is there a possibility that robotic surgery in this group of patients and I don't do robotic surgery, can help offset their ineligibility for laparoscopic surgery. Uh, I, I have uh, actually here uh, in, in uh, our room uh, Megan Costadio who does the robotic surgery, and I asked her personally that question, and she told me, um, 
when a patient has a difficult pelvis, it is difficult laparoscopically, robotically, and uh, open. Uh, it does uh, Dr. Efron think that the robotic surgery can offset the, the risks uh, in general associated with minimal invasive techniques in these patients? And also, if um, uh, um, you think that uh, the length of stay is really that uh, shortened in rectal cancer surgery, we don't have the same numbers as uh, laparoscopic colectomy, but it seems to me as I practice laparoscopic proctectomies that uh, the advantages in lectal stay tend to be more minimal in uh, rectal cancer surgery as opposed to colon cancer. And the other uh, question that I wanted to ask is whether uh, uh, there's any comment about the leak rate. Uh, the studies that Dr. Efron showed do not show a significant difference or a significant rate, but other studies, several, I would say, in laparoscopic rectal cancer surgery have shown a significant leak rate. Uh, would you comment on that? Is it just learning curve? Sure. Um, well, let's start with um, the uh, uh, obese patient. The mor morbidly obese patients, I think I agree with Megan, are, are difficult whether you're doing it open laparoscopically or robotically. I think uh, the robotic um, technique has two advantages to it that we don't necessarily have uh, through the laparoscopic technique, and that is one, adding another um, uh, arm to do adequate retraction, so we may get some better retraction, and two, um, uh, giving us uh, some better visualization and the ability to create greater forces of torque. Now, having said that, um, I think we can only uh, say that right now it looks promising, but not, uh, not uh, overly convincing, as we really have no good data on the robotic approach from any sort of prospective trial. Um, again, I think it's a tool, and I think you have to approach all of these patients with the best cancer operation for them. Um, because as you say, we have found the same thing with our length of stay. I mean, I think one thing that we found is especially for distal rectal cancers that we approach through a minimally invasive technique, we really make no incisions on the abdomen. We sort of approach it in a similar fashion to the to John Marks's Tata approach doing a transanal extraction and an anastomosis. And so the wound complication rates, I think, um, are significantly lower for those patients. The length of stay doesn't change for us because we make stomas in everybody. We make ileostomies in everybody, and that really keeps the patients here for at least four days. They have to feel comfortable with them before going home. We have to make sure they're not having eye output from the stoma. Uh, and all of the problems that you can have with an open proctectomy um, are uh, there for a uh, laparoscopic. Bowel obstructions, high output from the stoma, um, uh, 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 bladder dysfunction, all of those things are there. So I agree with you, Luca. We haven't seen the same reduction in our length of stay, um, but uh, I do think some of the wound complications are a little bit better. We sort of sacrifice function, though, maybe, uh, when approaching it that way, although John's uh, data, published data from uh, uh, Philadelphia wouldn't suggest that, 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 that their anal function and their uh, bowel function is similar. But with a transanal extraction, uh, sometimes uh, I don't think we've clearly defined what their function is compared to a double staple technique um, through uh, the laparoscopic approach. But I think that covered two of the three. I'm not sure what the third one was, Luca. Leak rate. Leak rate. Luca, did that get all the questions? Uh, just just a rate. comment on the leak rate in the laparoscopic series? Oh, the leak rate. Uh, um, I think that, I think our leak rate is uh, comparable. I think that um, I am very reluctant to uh, staple low in the pelvis. I think it's very difficult. So if we're doing anyone with a tumor that's um, uh, below, say, uh, five centimeters or six centimeters from the anal verge, we'll do a transanal approach. Um, which I think provides us a similar leak rate for uh, open or, or laparoscopic. Um, uh, I think laparoscopically it's very difficult with our current technology to, to do a, a double stable technique low in a male pelvis. Uh, some of that may change uh, with powered staplers that can reticulate at a 90 degree angle, but we'll have to wait for that technology to be approved.
management Chorus call if we can switch over to Israel to Shari Tzedek Medical Center, please. They have a question they want to ask. Good morning, Steve. Can you hear me? Yeah, Pataki, I can hear you, but I'm seeing John. It's Hi. like ventriloquism. Now, there you okay. are. Okay, that's okay. He's a nice guy. That's fine. I, I don't have any <laughs> problem with that. And uh, also, I would like to thank John for Jonathan for this excellent presentation. I would like to ask Jonathan, as a robotic uh, uh, surgeon, uh, when you do a robotic anterior resection, how much of the procedure is real robotic? Because from what I've seen, um, I'm not sure that we can really call these robotic uh, operations real robotic operations. There is always one or two surgeons at the table. Uh, some of the main uh, um, procedure or of the main technique in, during the case is done actually not by the uh, robotic surgeons, so-called. Uh, and I'm, I'm really not sure that when we call robotic uh, surgery uh, precisely for the rectum, we really uh, can, can uh, consider it as a true robotic uh, operation. So I would like to hear uh, from Jonathan's experience. So when, when, I, when I do a robotic uh, a proctectomy, I do a hybrid approach. So I do use the laparoscopic equipment to mobilize the colon. Um, once we go below the sacral promontory, we'll dock the robot between the legs. And the reason I approach it this way is that uh, docking the robot takes significant time. And uh, I think to truly get the benefit of the robot in the pelvis, it's best to have it between the legs of the patient. And if you do that, you don't have the reach that you need to mobilize the splenic flexure. Some people do dock the robot over the left leg of the patient. Um, but I think that limits your reach a little bit in the pelvis and a little bit in the uh, left upper quadrant. And so I choose not to do it that way. I do think once you're doing the robotic procedure um, in the pelvis, it, you, it's, a, it's a robotic procedure. I mean, we use, uh, I just use the robotic endo shears. Um, we use sharp dissection throughout all of the planes, and if we have some bleeding, use an electrocautery. Um, we may use an assistant through one of the other laparoscopic ports to do some extra retraction if needed. Um, but uh, I think, you, you know, it's as robotic as it's, as it's going to get. Again, I, the, the robot's not a different technique. It's a tool. It's like using a ligature or an end seal. I mean, if you have to, if you have a big obese patient and you have to divide the uh, mesentery without a vessel sealing device, it is incredibly painful. And I think that's the way you should look at the robot. If you have uh, a difficult pelvis, um, it may be of some benefit laparoscopically to approach that with a robot um, as opposed to uh, a, a traditional laparoscopic approach. Um, but I think that the, the, the data is not really there. And I do think that a lot of the use of the robot is being driven by uh, economic and other factors and, and, and not so much science at this point in time. Thanks, John, and, and thanks, thanks Patakia. Uh, another question from, sorry, go ahead, Patakia. No, I just I wanted to also, if you can address the issue of the division of the lower rectum. Um, I think this is one of the main problems in any rectal laparoscopic procedure. Uh, is the robot helping you to do this such a uh, division? Uh, I'm talking about the real low rectal division. Right. It, 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 the robot's not helping right now, but they do have a robotic stapler that's a mechanical stapler that will be able to reticulate to 90 degrees. Um, that has not been approved by the FDA yet, but it, it, it's coming soon. So with that technology, it may help us divide the lower rectum. Right now, for any distal rectal cancer that we're approaching minimally invasively, we will do a transanal excision. We'll do a, a little mucosectomy and then uh, intersyncteric dissection and bring the uh, specimen out through the anus and do a hand-sewn coloanal anastomosis. So um, I don't think it's helping us divide uh, the rectum per se. Um, uh, I think it uh, it may in the future. All right. Thanks. Thanks. 
No, th thanks both of you. Um, th that would be sort of an interesting paradigm if, if we, uh, that, that might become the world's most expensive stapler if we had to uh, use a robot and learn different technique to uh, facilitate a stapler. However, I will refrain from commenting more. Um, Cleveland Clinic main campus does have another comment. Luca. Uh, good morning. It's actually Megan. Howard, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation, John. Um, I just wanted to comment, I am doing robotic proctectomies. Um, I completely agree with John. It is a tool that helps me. Um, I don't know that I'll be able to measure that it helps the patient tr uh, tremendously, but certainly in a very difficult male pelvis, I'm much more comfortable on the other side. I don't know about my fellow. Um, I do a complete splenic flexure takedown and the <coughs> pelvis robotically. I do a left side dock um, and I do stay below and I do think the robot is helpful and the reason for that is I usually have myself and one assistant. So when that's the case, I have a camera hand, I have a stapler hand, my assistant usually is um, helping staple so they may have two hands. With the robot, I can actually leave the robot myself so I have three hands working, another hand, and then can use the stapler. So I think it helps me condense the rectum into a smaller, um, so that I can get a 45 stapler across it in the deep pelvis. So and with the side dock, I have the ability to do that, to push on the perineum or to get a little bit more length. So I am using the robot, and I do think it helps compared to straight laparoscopy doing it that way. Thanks, Megan. That's a very good, uh, practical, and, and honest answer. Um, in the absence of other questions, we're, we're 10 minutes past time, um, and I'd like to uh, have everybody join me in thanking John Efron for a, a very comprehensive, uh, provocative, and, and honest presentation of the results, current status, and glimpse into the future. And we'll see everybody again on April 5th when uh, the, Phil Shower is moderating the lecture entitled Duodenal Switch on the Rise by Dr. Fadi Mustara from the uh, Institut Universitaire de Cardiology at Pulmonology in Quebec. Thank you all. Have a good day and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right.